Because we've been in a series called Our Response Ability. And it's important to understand and know because all of us have the ability to respond. Because the things in life, we, we can't control what happens to us, can we? We can't control how people treat us, and we can't control the circumstances of life. But, and a big but, we have full control over how we respond to it. And the good news is this. It's not what happens to us that determines our destiny, but how we respond to it. And so our response ability is a series that I designed to help us take control of our lives. Because so many people in these times have felt out of control. And this is the opportunity for us to be able to, to respond in a way that we can move forward and fulfill the purpose and plan that God has for us. That we do not need to be subjected to all the circumstances of life. That we can take responsibility for our lives. And so our response ability. That was the first thing we dealt with the first week was that to move forward. We need to stop the blame game. We need to take full responsibility for our life. Why? Until you own it, you can't change it. Until you own it, you can't do something with it. And then last week we talked about this. We said to take control of our lives, we need to take charge of our thinking. Why? Because what we choose to think about is our choice. And God works to change us and transform us through our thinking. And so that's why we need to recognize and reject distorted thinking. Because distorted thinking creates barriers and obstacles in our lives. It's negative thinking. It's passive thinking. It's distorted in the ways that sometimes we believe things that are not necessarily true. And that's why God's word is so essential because God's word is truth. And anything that doesn't equal what God said is in fact a lie. And that's why the transformation process is a renovation process. We need to renovate the way we thought because the way we talked about it last week, renovation is ripping out old things and replacing it with new. And for our lives personally, it's discovering the lies that we once believed were true and ripping them out and replacing them with truth because the truth we embrace, Jesus taught us, is what makes us free. And so that's why today we're going to get into the third part. And the title of today's message is Get Connected. Why? Because our response ability is that we have the ability to choose for ourselves the people we do life with. And as the first point today that we recognize and understand is that we were created for connections. Let me say that again. All of us, you and me together, we were created for connections. See what I have here in my hand? This is a Lego. Now, you might have remembered playing with Legos. I know in my household with my kids, we loved Legos. We had lots of Legos. And a Lego has all of these connectors on the top. Why? Because Legos were created to be connected to other Legos. God created us for connections. Connection to him and the connection to others. And why would I say such? Because Jesus was asked the question one day, what's the most important thing to God? This is the way they asked the question. What's the biggest commandment? What's the greatest commandment? And Jesus' answer to that was twofold. He said, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. Both were important. It's not and or. It's and and both. In other words, we need to love God and we need to love others. That's become known as the great commandment. We were created to connect with God and to, create, and to connect with one another. Why? Because God is love. And at the center of creation is the unity of self-giving love what we've come to call the Trinity, that the God who created the heavens and the earth is the unity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one true God in three divine personalities. The essence of the, of the very creation, the center of it is self-giving love. And why is that important to us? Because we were created in God's own image and likeness. So in other words, we were created for loving God relationships. Listen to this scripture. In, in Genesis 2 and 18, now remember, what I'm about to read here is before sin entered the Garden of Eden. This is in, when God created all things, God said everything he created was good except for one thing. 
And in Genesis 2.18, it said, The Lord God said, It's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So in other words, at the point at which God was saying this, God was saying that even a relationship with him was not enough. Why? Because Adam at this moment had a relationship with God already. But God said that wasn't enough. We were created to connect with God and with others as well. And so God made one suitable. He made one to complete him. In other words, God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, took something from him, and built the woman and brought her to the man. In other words, there's things in others that we desperately need to be complete and to be full. Because God works by those connections with him and with one another. Why? Let me dispel something for a moment. I just want to take a, a short moment because some of you watching me have believed this idea that I only need a relationship with God. If that were true, then Adam, God would never have said it's not good for him to be alone. There's too many people in the body of Christ that have had this Lone Ranger mentality that I don't need others, I just need a relationship with God. That is not biblical. God created us for a connection with him, yes, and with others. It's not or, it's both. We need people and we need God desperately. And so we were created for love relationships. Why? Because listen to me, community is the ecosystem for human growth and flourishing. We were created for both giving and receiving of love. What's an ecosystem? An ecosystem is a complex system that works together. It's symbiotic. It all helps one another work. It's an ecosystem example would be a jungle. In a jungle environment, the plants take in the radiation from the sun and create oxygen, which helps the animals, and it causes the plants to grow and bring forth fruit, so there's food for the animals, and the animals eat the food. Their waste goes back into the soil, enriches the soil that helps the plants, and all of it works together. It's symbiotic. It all works in correlation together. Well, community is the ecosystem that God designed for humans to grow and to flourish. Because we need others to love us, and we need to love. So we need to give and receive. In fact, spiritual growth comes about through community where we experience three things. One, acceptance. Two, support. And number three, the challenge to be our best. We need all of those. The New Testament teaches us that we're to accept one another as Christ accepted us. So in essence, we can be with one another accepting each other. We should support and encourage and help each other be our best. But we also need to be challenged. We also need to not be content to remain where we are, but challenge each other to go beyond where we are and to be our absolute best because that's, in essence, how we glorify God. And that's why it's important. In a, in a healthy, vibrant community, we were created for loving relationships and we need different types of relationships in our lives. Two I want to highlight. One, we need relationships with mentors. And who are mentors? Mentors are people who help us, guide us in the big picture of life, in the decisions that relate to where we go in life, to fulfill our dreams and visions and all. Mentors are usually those who have gone before us, those who have experience and wisdom that can download into us. And so we need relationships like that, but we also need a second group that I call confidants. And what are confidants? Those are people that we divulge everything to. Those are the people we share our secrets with. We don't leave anything in the dark because many times when we're left alone with our thoughts, they can become toxic and we need to be able to bring it to light. And so confidence are people that we trust in. So in essence, what we need to begin to recognize and understand is to reach our full potential, we need relationships. We need honest, loving relationships to reach our full potential in God. And why do I say that? Because that's what the New Testament teaches. Listen to this. In the book of Ephesians, Paul wrote this. Ephesians 4 and verse 15. He said, instead we should speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body, the church. In other words, Paul says here we need people 
that will speak the truth to us in love. In other words, we need truth and we need love. We need both of those contents. Because Jesus, the Bible tells us, was full of grace and truth. It's both and they're essential. Because why? When God is developing us, when God is growing us, we need encouragement, we need love, we need support. But if there are areas that need to be corrected in our lives, things that need to be adjusted, we need the truth in those matters. It's kind of like this, if there was something physically wrong, and I went to the doctor, and the doctor said to me, well, we can correct that situation, but it's going to require an operation. And so if I submit to the operation, here's the point. Truth is like the scalpel. It's what can cut out whatever is bad, whatever is wrong. But you first experience what? Nobody would submit to surgery without anesthesia. So we want to anesthetize the wound. We want to numb it so that why? That we are not too sensitive to run away. And what's important is this. I call, I, I've said this for years, that the love of God is the anesthesia of the Spirit. In other words, people need to know how much they're loved, how much they're cared for, how much people truly believe in them, so that why? That they can be able to hear the truth that will set them free. Because see, that's one of the problems that have happened, and maybe you've been one of those that's been this way. And if it is today, if you can't say amen, say oh me. That you've run around and used the sword of the Spirit to try to correct everybody in your life without ever affirming, without ever making sure that people knew just how sincere and how deep your love was for them. You see, people need to know that what you're sharing isn't because you're ticked off or annoyed or because it bothers you, but because you believe in them, because you want the best for them. So that when they're able, because when, when we're anesthetized, when we're, when we're totally confident in the love of God, it's then we can open our hearts and allow the truth to set us free. So you don't really love somebody if you never ever share the truth with them that makes them better, that encourages them to get beyond the things that may be stumbling blocks or things that hold them back in life. But you don't start there. God didn't start there. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That God wants us to know how much he loves us. And when we do, it's only then that he begins to open us up to correct us and change us from the in side out. And that's why it's important. But, go, but Paul went on to say this in verse 16, which goes to show why we need others. He says this, he said, and makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. In other words, all the parts contribute to making us better. Just as my finger needs my hand, and my hand needs my arm, and my arm needs my torso, we truly do need one another. God has designed it that way specifically, that God does his best work many times through others. Because he says, speaking the truth in love, we can grow up because we're all a body. All of us have something to contribute. All of us have something to help one another reach our full potential. And we're better when we do it together. I always tell people all the time, come on, if you've ever worked out before, you know that exercising, you're far more faithful. You, 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 you sometimes put out far more energy, far more effort when you do it with other people than when you do it by yourself. Because if we're honest, when we do it by ourselves, if we don't feel like doing it, we don't do it. We don't tend to push ourselves as much. Others can help bring the best out in us. And so to reach our full potential, we need to recognize it that way. Because I'm going to tell you a story. Years ago, when I had the opportunity to go into business for myself, now I knew I had a calling into ministry, and I was in this, 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 this quandary because I wanted to hear from God. The opportunity being offered me was amazing. I saw the potential in it, but I couldn't realize what, what to do in this. And I I, I, I wrestled with that. I debated with that for almost a year. And at that time, I was living with my best friend. I was living with his parents in their home. And we were sharing a bedroom at the time. And so I was praying by my bed. And my friend walked in. And he said, dude, are you still wrestling with this decision, whether or not to take this opportunity? And then he knelt down on the other side of the bed. 
And he looked straight in my eyes and he said, Ken, doesn't the Bible say that Jesus opens doors that no one can shut and shuts doors that no one can open? Can't you believe that if Jesus is opening this door for you right now to prosper you, that he knows how to shut it when the right time comes? That was such a word from heaven for me. It brought all the, the unclarity away. I had such crystal clarity of what to do. And then God blessed me in that business for many years. See, in essence, God uses people often to come along beside us because that's my second point. Listen carefully. Listen, our connections determine the quality and the direction of our lives. It's true. Our connections determine the quality and the direction of our lives. Solomon, the, the wisest man that ever lived, wrote this in Proverbs 13, 20. It says, walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. Wow, that's a tough scripture because it's true. Because we become like the people we hang around. And he said, you want to be better? Then hang around people that help you be better. The wise walk with the wise. Because why? A companion of fools suffers harm. And some of the things, be honest with me, it's safe. You're watching this over the internet in some fashion or some capacity. But listen to me. Some of the things we regret most in life, it was people that talked us into it. It's people that advised us. It's people that, and they're things that we're ashamed of. It's things that we regret. It's stuff that we try to sweep under the rugs. Some of our biggest regrets, because the companion of fools suffers harms. And so in essence, we have a choice. We have an opportunity, and it's important because the people that we let into our lives, our friends, listen to me, our friends make us better or badder. In other words, good friends bring the best out of you. Good friends believe in you. Good friends won't let you settle. They, they know the potential that they have and they love you and encourage you and inspire you and they, they bring the best out of you. But at the same time, bad friends bring the worst out of us. And that's what you need to be honest about when you look in the mirror. When I hang around with certain folks, does it make me better or does it make me badder? And so in essence, it's important to recognize that end because the Bible gives us illustrations of this. There's one, there's a man in the New Testament talks about, his name was Barnabas. He's talked about a lot in the, in the book of Acts. His real name wasn't actually Barnabas, it was Joes. But the apostles renamed him Barnabas. And then it said the reason, it was in Acts 4, it was because he was called the son of encouragement. Or some translations say consolation. It's the Greek word, Greek word parakalesis. Parakalesis comes from two words. The word para means to come along beside. And klesis means to sense a calling to help somebody. It's someone who comes alongside to help us. And true friends, people who bring the best out of us, Barnabas was one of those people because when Saul of Tarsus had a conversion and met Christ in the city of Damascus, when he had began his journey to being a Christ follower, he became emboldened and began to preach Jesus. Well, the believers there in Damascus were scared of him because they knew he came on a mission to destroy Christianity in their city. But now he's preaching Christ, so everybody's confused. But the city officials put a death warrant on his life. So when it's heard, certain ones get Paul out of the city in a basket at night. But it was the man Barnabas that came along beside him and took Saul to Jerusalem to meet with James and Peter and John, the heads of the church at that time. And then Saul went away to where he had grown up in Tarshish, and Jesus revealed the gospel to him in more detail. But then a few years later, the apostles get word that all of these Gentiles were coming to faith in this northern city called Antioch. So they send Barnabas up there, who Barnabas, in viewing the work, saw the grace of God on them. And so he goes and gets who? He goes and gets Paul and brings Paul back to the city of Antioch and the two of them teach these new believers and it grows into the thriving church with leaders and all and it was from there that the Holy Spirit said separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them and they go out on their first mission trip and they take with them a young man whose name was John Mark but on that missionary journey this young man saw stuff he wasn't ready yet to handle and so he got freaked out and ran in fear. He went back to the city of Antioch and abandoned Barnabas and Paul. So when they finished their missionary journey and came back to Antioch, they taught in a year in the church. 
and then decided to go out again on a second journey. And Barnabas wanted to take John Mark along with him. And Paul said, what? Are you kidding me? That panty waist, that, 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 that coward, that, that mama's boy, are you kidding? No, we ain't taking that chicken, that coward with us. And the, the contention became so great, the Bible tells us, that they went their own separate way. But you see, Barnabas understood. Because the truth is, guys, one time is never fatal. Your failures are not final. You see, you need people to understand the gospel. God gives us second chances, third chances, more than you can even imagine. That's why you need the right people coming around beside you. Because here, Paul was willing to kick him to the curb. But Barnabas said, no, I'm going to pour into this. I see potential in this young man. So Paul chose Silas, went off on his own. Barnabas stuck with John Mark. And let me tell you this. Number one, the Apostle Paul's ministry never would have been what it was without Barnabas. But at the same time, we would have never had what we call the Gospel of Mark if it hadn't been for Barnabas. That's why Paul in his later years when he was in prison recognized his own era and said, send Mark to me because he's profitable for me in the ministry. And why was all of that happening? Because of somebody who was a good friend named Barnabas. See, all of us, you need good friends in your life. In fact, I think everyone needs four crazy faith friends in your life. You know, one of the very first small groups talked about in the Bible was about a guy who couldn't walk. He was carried around on a mat by four friends. So this these, this five-person small group, these four guys, these friends of the dude who's paralyzed, said, we want to get you to Jesus, bro. So they take their friend and, and, and imagine the trust they had in one another. Because this guy, the guy that's paralyzed, had to agree to it in some capacity, right? They didn't make him go. But he was probably embarrassed, probably ashamed that his friends are having to carry him everywhere he goes. But his friends believed in him so much. No, dude, you can be, you can walk again. We just got to get you to Jesus. So they show up and what happens? The whole place is packed to capacity. They can't get in. And the guys are not going to give up. They're like, no, we came all this way. We're going to take you up on the roof and let you down. I mean, imagine the trust that had to happen in that relationship. That, that, that crippled guy to allow them to pull him up on the roof. And those guys, those four friends, you know, I always wondered afterwards, the owner of the house, did they have to repair his roof? They have to pay for that, that stuff to happen? I mean, think about that. But they love their friend enough to go, whatever it takes, man. We want to see you reach your full potential. We love you. We're willing. And that's why all of us, guys, we need at least four crazy faith friends in our life that won't give up on us, that won't take no for an answer, that won't let us quit on our destiny or our dreams. Listen to me. It's your friends that determine the quality and the direction of your life. But you got to go in a way that is unified. Because listen to this. Amos 3.3 says this. Can two people walk together without agreeing on direction? In other words, to go in the right way, you have to be willing to agree. And that's why it's important. The friends in your life need to be the people that are heading in the direction that you're heading in. Because some of our greatest quandaries, some of our greatest wrestling points is when our friends are going in a different way and we believe God's asking us to go this way. It's those decisions, it's those tensions because that's why it should be easy, guys, to form relationships in the body of Christ. Why? Because we're all followers of Jesus. In other words, we should all be heading in the same direction. We should all have the same goal to be like him. So the church should be the place we, we begin to form. That's why groups, guys, we've, put, we've said are so critical, so important to our maturing and developing in our spiritual lives. Because it's people that we've decided to go in the same direction with. Because why? We need this in the book of James. James 5, 16, it says this. James 5, 16, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. You see, we need people that we love and trust enough to be able to tell our secrets because you're only as sick as your secrets. See, what you hold inside, what you, what you allow guilt and remorse to destroy your conscience and to, to make you think less of yourself, you need to find a group of people, or at least one, that you can divulge and open up and share your full heart with. Because why? 
as the scripture here teaches us, that as we confess our sins, we are healed. Because why? Just like a wound. When a wound is there, sometimes it needs light before it'll ever heal. And things that too often, the enemy, our enemy works in darkness. And that's why you need to be willing and find people that you can trust, that love you for who you are. Listen to me, not people that'll judge you, not people that'll make you feel shame, but people who love you enough to help you heal, to help you be everything. Because what this scripture tells us is this, we confess our sins to God for forgiveness, but we confess our sins to one another for healing, for freedom. I mean, come on, be honest with me. How many of you out there, you, can, you, you don't have to fess up right now because you may be watching with others and you're too embarrassed to say it, but listen. How many times have we confessed things to God and gone out and done it again? In fact, some of you are devious enough to think you found a loophole where you can sin as much as you want. And I just got, you know, 1 John 1, 9, pushed the button and said, if I confess my sin, he is faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And so you go out and do it again without thinking about it. But you see, when you're willing to tell other people that hold you accountable, that care about you and love you, that know that that behavior that you need to eject out of your life to be the best you can be, love you enough to walk with you. And we often find the freedom because there's power. When we confess it, when we bring it to the light, it loses its power because the enemy has immense power in darkness. And when you're not willing to allow the things you struggle with to remain in darkness, that's what God uses to bring freedom into your life. In other words, as James here says, we confess our sins to find forgiveness from God, but we confess our sins to one another to find healing and freedom to reach our full potential. And that's why Proverbs 27, 6 says this, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. In other words, Faithful of the wounds. I wouldn't be the man I am today because some of the people I know love me, they care about me, were willing to tell me at times in my life things that I needed to hear, not what I wanted to hear. Because many times we want to hear certain things, but it's not necessarily what we need to hear. And you have to have people that are, that are invested in you and that love you enough that in the right time, in the right way, will tell you what you need to hear, not necessarily what you want to hear, and those things, they may be tough, but they will in truth make you better. Because why? If you flatter, if you just kiss and you're just, everything's good, everything's great, well, guess what? Nobody's that good. <laughs> Nobody's that good. There are times we need somebody willing to love us enough to tell us what we need to hear. Because why? Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Good friends love you enough to tell you what you need to know, not just what you want to know. And that leads me to my third point is this. We need connections that recharge us. We need connections that recharge us. Come on, be honest with me right now. Wherever you're watching this at, you know that there's some people in your life that drain you. They are, they, 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 and there are other people that you get around and they recharge you. You feel, in other words, listen to me. There are some people that put life into us. I mean, we get around them, we feel like, man, I can rip the lips off the devil. I, I, I can do anything. I, I feel encouraged. I feel inspired, man. I can be who God called me to be. You get around those kind of people and it's like, man, you want to go out and do life. And then you get around other people, they drain the life out of you. I call them the vampires. In other words, they suck the life out of you. And sometimes they don't mean it. They're just people sometimes that are needy, that are always clinging and holding and pulling and pulling and pulling. And they never give anything back. They're always wanting. They're always pulling. They're always drawing. And life is about giving and receiving. And so you need to be honest at times. Because you need to define the people that charge you, the people that energize you, the people that recharge you. Because why? To be your best, you need to get around them. It's kind of like my cell phone here, okay? We know that our cell phones work at their optimal potential when they're charged and need to be constantly recharged, right? We need to constantly do it because when you're using them, it starts to drain on its battery and then you have to recharge it. Well, God designed our lives to be able to be recharged. And that's why there are certain people, Paul put it this way, listen to this. In the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul said this, For we came into Macedonia, and we had no rest, but we were harassed at every turn. 2 Corinthians uh, 7 and verse 5. You ever been there? Paul said, he came into Macedonia, we had no rest, we were harassed at every turn. 
Conflicts on the outside, fears on the inside. That maybe where some of you are at right now. With all that's going on, you're like, whoa, life's just upside down. Things are going bad. I feel like fears inside and conflicts and stresses and all this outside. Paul said, listen, that's where he was, but look at verse number six. It says, but God who comforts the downcast. And good news is that God is a comforter, guys. That's what you need to realize. But how does God comfort us? Listen to how Paul went on to say. But God who comforts us, comforted us by the coming of Titus. In other words, how did God bring comfort to Paul in this moment? One of his companions, one of his friends. He got recharged. He got encouraged. He got inspired because of the coming of Titus. God does some of his best work through others. And so in essence, here again, he goes on to say, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort you had given him. He told us about your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me, so that my joy was greater than ever. See, community is the ecosystem for human growth and flourishing. And spiritually speaking, we do need one another. And God works through that end to comfort us. There are people that come into our lives that believe in us, who inspire us, who bring the best out of us. That's what we need to choose. We have a response ability. Who we do life with is our choice. And what I want you to know today is that you can choose the type of people and you need to have people in your life that recharge you. You need the people that give life to you because you need to be honest. Some of you right now, listen to me carefully. Some relationship in your lives right now, some of them need the acts of the apostles. And I'm not talking about A-C-T-S. I'm talking about the A-X-E. Some of you need to cut them off. Some of you need to let go because they are draining the life out of you. There are times of ministry, but when we're healthy, when we're strong, we're able to give and not need anything in return. You need to be honest. When people drain you, when you feel like you can't even go forward, you need to get around folks that in charge you, that invigorate you, that give life into you. Because listen to this last scripture here. In the book of 1 Samuel, two friends that really helped each other be. But it's 1 Samuel 23 verses 15 and 16. It said, while David was at Horash in the desert of Zinth, he learned that Saul had come to take his life. Now, you, you think about that. That's really stressful times. Saul at that time was the king of Israel. David was on the run. David was considered a traitor because Paul, because Saul had said that David was against him, that David was not faithful. David was not loyal. He had lied about David. La David was being hunted down by the army of Israel, all after this one man. And now David hears that Saul has come to take his life. But look at what happens in verse 16. And Saul's son Jonathan went to David at Horash and helped him find strength in God. See, good friends will, fo will come and find you. Good friends will chase after you. Good friends will not let you remain in hiding. They'll come and encourage you and inspire you. But look what he did. He helped him find strength in God. The best friends in our lives point us to the source of ultimate strength. They're the people that remind us of the faithfulness of God. You read this whole passage, you realize that Jonathan said, you will be the next king. What's, what Samuel the prophet spoke will come to pass. I know it looks dire. I know it doesn't look good now, but God is faithful and he helped him find strength in God. We all need those crazy faith friends that come around us, that don't let us hide, that don't let us stay away. In fact, right now, guys, some of you know people that you haven't heard from in a while. Don't wait to hear from them. Go after them, call them, text them, go inspire them, help them find strength in God. We all need people like that because here, good friends help us in those times. We need to build relationships because in these moments, strong relationships are built. Well, not when we pretend like we got it all together because guess what? None of us do. None of us do. Strong relationships are when willing to admit that we do need one another. And that's where we gain that understanding. So listen to me today. Every one of you, to take control of your life, you need to remember that you need to get connected. Why? Choosing who you do life with is, in truth, your choice. You have a response ability, the ability to respond. So in essence, getting around you people, because why? You were created for connection. But your connections determine the quality and the direction of your life. And you need connections that recharge you. 
So all of you, think about that end. Right now, you can jump on an e-group. Right now, you can get connected. Right now, you can do something about it. Don't sit there and wait for it to happen. Respond. Do something about it.